in the dimly lit corridors of an Indianapolis hospital, a team of doctors and nurses gathered around an infant patient brought in under disturbing circumstances. The child, only two weeks old, was examined with careful, gentle hands as the medical staff inspected a series of troubling injuries. Mouth-shaped bruises and visible teeth marks marked her tiny shoulder, arms, stomach and legs an unsettling sight that immediately raised red flags. Her father, 26-year-old Gavin Rogers, had accompanied her to the hospital, along with a woman. When questioned by the concerned medical staff, Rogers dismissed the bruises with a shocking nonchalance. He claimed he might have open-mouth kissed the infant a little too hard, explaining that his actions were merely affectionate and perhaps he had been overly enthusiastic in showing his love for his newborn daughter. But to the hospital staff, his words felt hollow and failed to account for the disturbing severity of the injuries they were observing. One particular nurse, whose years of experience had sharpened her instincts, felt uneasy from the moment Rogers entered the hospital with the baby. As she observed him closely, her discomfort only grew. Rogers appeared tense, frequently shifting in his seat and glancing around the room. His frustration became palpable whenever the newborn cried, and in a horrifying moment, he was overheard muttering bitter, chilling remarks about his own daughter. Words like ungrateful and evil slipped from his lips, sending a wave of unease through the nearby staff members. In a particularly shocking outburst, he even referred to the baby as a little bitch, a remark that left the attending nurses questioning how someone could speak with such cruelty about their own child. This growing apprehension among the hospital staff quickly turned to outright concern. Despite Rogers' casual dismissal of the bruises, the nursing team recognized the marks as intentional injuries, not accidental. They immediately contacted the Indiana Department of Child Services, DEX, determined to prevent the child from returning to a potentially dangerous environment. The case escalated, and soon, Detective Joseph Turney from the Whitestown Police Department was assigned to investigate. Turney began his inquiry by examining the photographic evidence of the infant's bruises and bite marks. The images revealed a pattern of violence that could not be brushed off as mere love bites, as Rogers had claimed. Detective Turney, well versed in cases involving domestic abuse, meticulously reviewed the photos, each one more distressing than the last. The small, fragile body of the infant bore unmistakable signs of what could only have been inflicted with deliberate, excessive force. In his report, Turney noted that the nature of the injuries indicated severe pain had likely been inflicted upon the newborn. The marks were too deep, the bruising too pronounced, to be the result of an innocent, affectionate gesture. The detective knew he was looking at something far more sinister. Meanwhile, as the hospital staff continued caring for the infant, they couldn't shake the dread that hung over the room whenever Rogers was nearby. Several nurses reported feeling an instinctual unease around him an almost palpable darkness that seemed to hover in his presence. One of the nurses, deeply troubled by what she had seen and heard, documented her observations in a report. She noted how Roger's behavior changed dramatically whenever the baby cried his expression turning cold, his movements sharp and agitated. She expressed her profound discomfort with the idea of sending the child home with him, voicing a fear that resonated with her fellow staff members. Despite Roger's attempts to downplay his actions, the weight of the evidence against him grew. When questioned by detectives, he attempted to provide an alternative explanation, stating that he had intended the marks to be love bites given to his daughter while, while she was fully clothed. But the nurse's testimonies, along with his own disturbing comments, painted a different picture, one of a frustrated father unable, or perhaps unwilling, to control his impulses around his vulnerable child. The investigation intensified as Dax collaborated with the police, piecing together a fuller picture of Roger's interactions with his daughter. They examined every word of his recorded statements, every report filed by the hospital staff, and every photograph taken of the infant's injuries. As the case against Roger's grew, the disturbing reality of the situation began to settle in. Each new piece of evidence seemed to underscore the urgency of the investigation, and the authorities moved swiftly determined to protect the newborn from any further harm. The Indiana Department of Child Services took immediate action, ensuring that the infant would not return to an environment where she might face further abuse. Rogers, however, remained defiant. 
In interviews with the police, he continued to offer explanations that seemed both callous and detached. He insisted that he had only been showing affection, an assertion that was at odds with the gravity of the bruises and bite marks on the baby's body. When confronted with the photos, he hesitated but stuck to his story, brushing off the idea that he had done anything to harm his child intentionally. But even in the face of the mounting evidence, his behaviour only deepened the suspicions surrounding him. According to the hospital's nursing staff, Rogers had exhibited anger and frustration during his time in the hospital, frequently reacting harshly to the infant's cries. One nurse's account described a particularly unsettling interaction. Rogers had become visibly agitated, his face tightening as he muttered that his daughter was ungrateful and evil. To the nursing staff, such words, combined with the bruises, painted a deeply disturbing picture of a man who appeared to harbour resentment toward his own newborn. Detective Turney, tasked with putting together the facts, noted in his report that the injuries were highly unlikely to have occurred accidentally. They were consistent with forceful bites that would have inflicted significant pain, an observation that effectively dismantled Roger's claims of innocent affection. The detective was certain that Roger's actions had crossed a line, one that placed the infant in grave danger. As the investigation continued, the prosecution began building their case, determined to hold Rogers accountable for the injuries inflicted on his daughter. The evidence they amassed left little room for doubt. The legal proceedings against Gavin Rogers soon followed, with each disturbing detail from the investigation strengthening the case. Prosecutors highlighted the brutality of the injuries, pointing to the severity of the bruises and the depth of the bite marks as evidence of intentional harm. They argued that Rogers' explanations simply didn't align with the facts, especially given the statements from the hospital staff, who had witnessed his unsettling behaviour. Throughout the trial, the nursing staff's accounts painted a vivid picture of the atmosphere in the hospital room, where Rogers' frustration with his newborn's cries had quickly transformed into chilling words and actions. The phrase ungrateful stood out as especially troubling, a word that seemed bizarre and inappropriate for a two-week-old child who could only cry to communicate her needs. The prosecution argued that such language revealed an underlying hostility, a dangerous mindset that may have led Rogers to inflict harm under the guise of affection. The nurses' reports were reinforced by the testimony of Detective Turney, who shared his professional assessment of the injuries. Turney explained to the court that the bruises, particularly on areas like the shoulder, forearm and knee, were the result of excessive force. He emphasised that the injuries could not have been inflicted without causing severe pain, and that they were consistent with purposeful, aggressive actions. His statement dismantled any notion of accidental harm, underscoring the serious nature of the abuse. The photographs of the bite marks and bruises were presented as evidence, capturing the court's attention with their graphic clarity. Each image revealed more than words could convey, depicting a tiny, defenseless body marked by physical harm. The jury sat in silence as the images were shown, the gravity of the case settling heavily over the room. It was clear that the harm inflicted was far beyond anything that could be excused or explained away as accidental. Rogers, however, remained unyielding. Even as evidence mounted against him, he clung to his initial story, repeating that he had only meant to give his daughter love bites. His defence argued that Rogers had no malicious intent, asserting that he had simply been over-enthusiastic in his interactions with his child. But with the weight of the testimony and the photographic evidence, his claims rang hollow and the prosecution pressed forward with their case. As the trial progressed, the courtroom was filled with tension. The testimonies of medical professionals, detectives and child protection workers collectively painted a picture of neglect and abuse that was hard to ignore. Each witness detailed their observations of Rogers, unsettling behaviour and the physical evidence of harm that had been left on his newborn daughter's tiny frame. One of the most impactful testimonies came from a nurse who had been assigned to care for the infant during her hospital stay. With a steady voice, she recounted the fear she had felt when observing Roger's reactions to his daughter's cries. She described him as visibly agitated, his expressions shifting from frustration to what she could only describe as anger. The nurse's discomfort was echoed in her formal report, where she noted her reluctance to send the child home under his care, fearing that his temper could lead to further harm. 
The prosecution capitalized on these statements, arguing that the hospital staff's reactions underscored the immediate danger the child faced in her father's presence. They emphasized the profound level of concern expressed by the nursing team a team, but had collectively felt the need to notify the Indiana Department of Child Services. The DCS's prompt intervention, combined with the hospital's swift response, ultimately prevented the infant from returning to what could have been a dangerous home environment. Roger's defense team attempted to challenge the accounts, arguing that his remarks about the baby being ungrateful were merely expressions of frustration common to new parents. However, this argument failed to gain traction in the face of the physical evidence and the accounts of those who had witnessed his behavior firsthand. The language he had used, particularly terms like evil and little bitch, painted a picture that was difficult for the defense to refute. The prosecution argued that such language was not only inappropriate but indicative of deeper issues, suggesting that Rogers viewed his daughter with resentment rather than love. As closing arguments approached, the courtroom was left with the undeniable image of a newborn suffering at the hands of her own father. The evidence had spoken clearly, leaving the jury with little doubt about the events that had transpired. When it came time for closing arguments, the prosecution presented a powerful summation, weaving together each piece of evidence to reinforce their case against Rogers. They urged the jury to consider the unmistakable signs of intent, pointing out that the bite marks and bruises covering the infant's body could not have resulted from a mere lapse in judgment. They argued that Rogers' actions were deliberate, driven by an unnerving hostility that had been revealed through his own words and behavior. In a final emotional appeal, the prosecution reminded the jury of the vulnerability of a newborn, highlighting how utterly defenseless the infant had been in the face of such violence. They emphasized that the marks on her body were not expressions of love, as Rogers had claimed, but rather a physical manifestation of his resentment and anger. The jury was asked to see through Rogers' explanations, to recognize the pain and suffering his actions had caused, and to deliver justice on behalf of his daughter. The defense, meanwhile, tried to reframe Rogers' behavior as nothing more than a mistake born out of inexperience and frustration as a new parent. They maintained that Rogers had no malicious intent, repeating his claim that he had simply nibbled too hard out of affection. His defense team argued that his words and actions, however unsettling, were not enough to prove deliberate harm. They implored the jury to consider the possibility that Rogers had acted out of ignorance, not malice. Despite these efforts, the defense's arguments did little to sway the overall perception of the case. The mounting evidence, combined with Rogers' disturbing language and behavior, made it difficult for the jury to view his actions as anything but intentional harm. As they deliberated, the photographs of the infant's injuries and the testimony of the hospital staff echoed in their minds, shaping the outcome of their decision. In the end, the jury found Rogers guilty of domestic battery resulting in bodily injury to a person less than 14 years of age. The sentencing, which followed shortly after, reflected the seriousness of the crime. Rogers was sentenced to three years in jail, with one year to be served behind bars and two years on supervised probation, a decision that aimed to provide justice for the victim while allowing for oversight upon his eventual release. As the sentencing concluded, a quiet relief settled over the courtroom. For the hospital staff, the medical team, and everyone involved in the investigation, the verdict marked a significant step toward justice. The infant's plight had weighed heavily on those who had worked to protect her, and the knowledge that Rogers would face the consequences of his actions offered a measure of reassurance that she was now safe from harm. Following the sentencing, authorities arranged for the infant to be placed in protective custody, ensuring she would be cared for in a nurturing and secure environment far removed from the hostility she had endured. The Indiana Department of Child Services continued to monitor her welfare, coordinating with child protection agencies to find a long-term solution for her care. News of the case spread, drawing attention to the importance of vigilance in situations involving potential harm to children. Hospital staff were praised for their quick response, and for recognizing signs of abuse that could easily have been dismissed. The case also highlighted the critical role of child protection services and law enforcement in intervening before more serious harm could be inflicted. In the weeks that followed, 
the nursing staff reflected on the unsettling encounter with Rogers and the difficult but necessary steps they had taken. Their swift decision to contact Dex had played a key role in securing the infant's safety, reinforcing the importance of listening to one's instincts when something feels amiss. The case served as a reminder that even the smallest signs of potential abuse deserve attention and action, as they may be the only chance to protect those who cannot protect themselves. For Rogers, the journey ahead involved a year behind bars, followed by two years of strict supervision. Under probation, he would be closely monitored to ensure compliance with the court's conditions. Any deviation from these terms would likely lead to further consequences, a safeguard put in place to prevent any risk to vulnerable individuals in the future. As the final chapter of this tragic case closed, it left a lasting impact on all involved. The story of the infant's ordeal served as both a cautionary tale and a testament to the power of vigilance and empathy in the face of abuse. Those who had worked tirelessly to protect her took comfort in knowing they had acted decisively and responsibly, ultimately providing a chance for the young child to grow up in a safe and loving environment.